This is your Chargers linebacker, Dan Henley, and you're tuning in with Chargers Unleashed. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dale Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. If this is your first time tuning into the show. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Dan Wolkenstein, we are at the fringe of now having the draft go from two digits in numbers to one digit in number. We are still 10 days away, just 10 days away from the NFL draft. And as I said during our live show yesterday with Jason... The buzz has already so been has been so palpable with the Chargers over the last several months. I can only imagine what the next ten days are going to bring. Uh, but sir, it's good to see your face. Good to have you back on. Let's talk some draft. I'm ready. I'm ready. Welcome to Chargers Unleashed Live. As we say every time, this is always one that gets us most excited. We love doing live shows. You know the drill. Uh, if you are wanting a topic or question or comment shown and or discuss the show put it in the chat below and or on the side depending on what you're looking at in your streaming service and we'll do our best to kind of bring it in this one as you guys and gals probably could imagine is going to be centered around the draft particularly not just what positions the chargers need because obviously everyone's talked about that at nauseum but when to expect the chargers to actually go after those positions depending on what they need with those specific positions so we'll get through that Obviously, the buzz, the hype is a plenty right now for not just the Chargers, but every NFL team who thinks and believes truly that they have what it takes to become the next Super Bowl champion. Can the Chargers do it? I don't know. We'll find out. Jake, it is so good to be back on. Uh, had some R and R for a bit, which has been nice uh, to kind of recharge the batteries. But if we're being real, we all know the drill. How much Chargers football can you go without having before it sucks you back in? Exactly. Where and do I, we start? Oh my God. Uh, I mean, where where do you? I mean, where do you want to start, Dan? Because yeah, as you said, what this episode is going to center around. Because now, especially the, for the fact that we're getting so close to it, we touched on this a little bit yesterday, and that's kind of where I got the idea for the topic, of, the main topic of the show today, is that there could be some surprise positions that the Chargers prioritize earlier than others. I know we all have our mock drafts. We all put them out. Majority of them is it's going to be Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, or Roma Dunze with the first pick for the Chargers, and we totally understand that. Or it's a trade back, and then the Chargers go a different direction. But what do the Chargers do beyond the first round? And I know I've been the advocate to always say, like, there's no way that they can come out of day two without selecting a cornerback. But there are some positions that Dan and I have done some top tens about, positions that we actually haven't gotten a chance to highlight as much that kind of could be sneaky target positions for them when you really look at the roster and what their needs are. And obviously this is going to all determine on how the board falls to them. But we wanted to kind of just give like a brief overview prediction style as far as just go position by position as far as what the Chargers really need and try to target when the best opportunities for them to select those positions in that circumstance. Yeah, uh, let's get to some of these comments because we always know how this goes. We go through and all of a sudden they start flying in and we get way too uh, behind on these. So I'm going to start off at the top here, Jake. Let's go all, right. all I'm it. scrolling and scrolling and scrolling to get there. Uh, first comment in the chat is, if Marvin Harrison Jr. goes to Arizona and either we pick or stick and pick or move back and stake another second round pick, if we go offensive line, while wow, this keeps going with the first pick, at that point, do we kick the can down the road and get Rice later in the draft? I'm assuming he means Brendan Rice out of USC. Yes. No. <laughs> in short, no. If that's the best receiver that they get in this draft class, Chargers got some problems, in my opinion. <laughs> this is the scenario that you have to wonder about it. Like in this case of this question right here, if MHA goes to Arizona, we either stick and pick or move back. Let's just say the Chargers trade back, which obviously is a popular scenario. A lot of people say, Dan and I have talked about it, that if a trade back happens to take place, and for this argument, let's just say it's with the Minnesota Vikings, the Chargers then get 11 and 23. We're all right with the argument of selecting a tackle at 11. We're okay with that because you're getting extra draft capital in that situation. At 11? But at, at 11, yes. Not at 5. At 11. <laughs> but you do that with knowing 
that you're missing out on the top three wide receivers in this draft. You make that decision knowing that. And let's just say, for example, the pick ends up being an offensive tackle at 11, who still ends up being there at 23, if you even target a wide receiver. I mean, it's we know that the Chargers need to address that with a high priority draft pick. We obviously don't know how the board is going to fall, but obviously names like Brian Thomas Jr., A.D. Mitchell, hopefully would still be on the board for the Chargers at 23. But Dan, I spoke, I talked about this yesterday. Let's just say all for anybody who is still saying that the Chargers are going to stick and pick at five and select Joe Alt, which again, I'm not poo-pooing Joe Alt, the player, but just think about this for a second. If you select Joe Alt and you go all the way, now you're at pick 37. How many wide receivers have now gone in the first round ahead of you? And let's remember seven, how the second round is seven, going probably. to be because Carolina is going to take a wide receiver with their first selection in the draft to get more help for Bryce Young. You know the Patriots, if they take a quarterback at three, they desperately need a wide receiver, and they're picking ahead of you. So where do you go in, in that circumstance? And again, we're talking about other positions we haven't even mentioned yet from the standpoint of corner. So this type of scenario is just – it's it's fascinating and terrifying to go to go yeah yeah I, like honestly like this wide receiver class has a half-life like there is a half-life of this receiver class where you get to a certain point and the shelf drops you get to a certain point again the shelf drops again and before you know it what was a very deep and stacked wide receiver class becomes kind of barren in a hurry if you're not going receiver in the first Let's just say the first two days. I would argue round one and two, but let's just say the first two days. And and this is a part of the larger discussion we'll have here in a second. But if you look at certain position groups along this Chargers roster, and you say to yourself, could they make do with what they have? Or do they need somebody to improve it in order for it to be like an NFL caliber roster? So for example, like if you look at the linebacking core, with this current Chargers team. Could it be improved? Obviously. Absolutely. Does it need help? Absolutely. Could they make do with what they have with it plus maybe a mid to rate round selection? I'd argue yes. Could you say the same for wide receiver? Could you say the same for corner? Hell no. I think you could say the same for tackle, in my opinion. Center this year, probably. But that's kind of the premise of this conversation today. I was like, if they need help to be NFL competent, when does that position have to get drafted? Yeah, Dan, uh, another one of these. I know this is was a personal favorite of yours. You like to call it the Dan special. If we trade back and get 11 and 23, I would love to see another trade back with either the 11th or the 23rd pick, <laughs> which you've been an advocate of this for a while now. And some people have actually done mock drafts that we have seen in the mainstream that have actually had this situation taking place. From 23 would be fun. I didn't think about that. If they draft 11 and then, cause they can use 11 on the premium skill position. Like they can go receiver, they can go corner. 11 could probably be a receiver. They could probably do edge if they wanted to. I know a lot of people like lot to. But trading back out of 23 and getting something like, let's say, somewhere in the 28 to 32, and then trading and then getting a mid second round pick along with it, and you go 11, I'm just making up a number 29, 37, 46, or whatever. That's how you get a haul. That's how you rebuild a roster on a fast track. Yeah, the Danny special, I'm taking it. The Holy Grail, I'm hoping, praying that it happens. Like that, that's a way that they can do it for sure. Um, Kevin Kernick says, I need an actual reason why this pick won't be a receiver if you stay at five because nobody has a good one. Not true. Again, not true. Personally, I would rather them not go tackle at five. There are, there's good rationale behind doing it, it's just rationale that most don't believe in and agree with. We've heard many of people talk about it who are very bright minds about why the Chargers could, and in their opinion, should take tackle at five. That goes along with a different mindset and a different roster building philosophy than a lot of Chargers fans. Doesn't make it wrong, just makes it different. So 
nobody has a good one a little far for me. I don't want tackle at five, but like I understand the rationale if someone did it. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I, I think like to to start kind of the broader conversation here of the main topic of the show, I guess what would be the floor, Dan, that you would say the Chargers cannot walk out of round fill in the blank uh-huh. without addressing wide receiver. And this is how we'll oh. conduct this entire conversation. <laughs> like legitimately <laughs> before I even finish my sentence, Dan already knows what he's about to say. There's no way that they can walk out of round one without a receiver, right? No, actually I, there's probably, so I look at this, like, I, I think the Chargers need, like, a bona fide wide receiver. And in my opinion, like, there, again, there's, like, there's shelves to that, right? There's the top three that everyone knows, talks about. We don't need to talk about them. Like, there's them who would be bona fide superstars. Then after that, there's, like, another shelf that I think will be incredible prospects that could easily be wide receiver ones in the next couple of years. A.D. Mitchell, Brian Thomas Jr., etc. cetera. Um, then if the Chargers decide they want to do the basketball team route, like there's other folks like uh, a Ricky Pearsall, Ladd McConkey, Roman Wilson type, yes. which if we're talking separators, yeah, I can see those happening. And that's kind of a round two thing, right? Then you kind of go to the next tier, which is probably the end of my tier, like the Xavier Leggett type, where a little bit riskier, but he has all the archetype, all the traits that you want. Um, you can go Tez Walker. like That's probably the end of it. So in my opinion, it's probably got to be, I would say the, the latest that they can get one with a chance of them becoming a impact receiver would probably round three. Oh, round three okay but even but even that like it's barren like there's like two or three guys yeah and they can and you can fill it in later because let's say they get let's say they go in that second tier they get ad mitchell somehow which i love i'm very high ad mitchell or like they put a flyer out jermaine burton falls and you know this staff thinks that they can kind of reel them in and keep them on the straight and narrow great love these guys but they don't do everything. Fast forward to round five, six, you can get a lot of receivers there that can fill in a lot of that underbelly of the wide receiver depth. So if I had to say what round the Chargers had to get at least one receiver by, preferably round two, but I could see it stretched to round three depending on who they get. I think I think it's rolling the dice a little bit if you wait till round three. I'm going to say the floor would be round two. And again, this could come in a variety of different ways with a trade down. The Chargers get extra draft capital, whether it's trading at five or 37 and moving around the board, however they do it. But yeah, I don't think that there's any way, especially when you lose the production of Keenan Allen and Mike Williams, that you can't come out of at least round two with a wide receiver option there. Dan, let's flip it over to corner. Let's flip this over to corner. Real quick, on this, Nick, I think, gives the perspective that I think a lot of Chargers fans maybe sometimes don't like, but I hope can appreciate. (laughs) This is is true. In the previous regime, right? Like there were a lot of like telltale signs of what this team was going to do, of what they've done, of like brace for impact moments. Round three. Round three, round four. Yep. (laughs) We're not trading. Just take your popcorn. Just wait for the pick. We're good. But Nick says, isn't it fun not knowing what the Chargers are going to do with Hortiz and Harbaugh, especially your one. Everything that everyone, including us, is saying about how this team drafts, who they're going to draft, what they prioritize, what the offense is going to look like, all of it is a guess. It's an educated guess at best. We've not seen what this new team will look like. So, yeah. That's why everyone is so forking anxious and nervous about the draft because we have no clue what the hell the team's going to do. No. Now the intrigue is palpable. It really is. And uh, look, there's one exception to this where I would not want to see the Chargers trade down, and that is if Marvin Harrison Jr. still happens to be on the board at five. But at the same time, it's just like you actually have people now in charge of this franchise that are – used to making moves like that and know how they want this team to be built up and have that type of camaraderie with one another. So yeah, 
again, I, I have said it for weeks now. Do not pigeonhole yourself into one scenario. Otherwise, you will be disappointed. I think that this team has some curveballs. It could actually be some curveballs for the best possible reason on what they might throw out uh, the night of the draft. Uh, Dan, let's go to corner because this is... I'm, I'm feeling okay, by the way. You are Daniel. good, good. I had a, I had a I'm long... I had a, I had a... I had a um, I drank a lot of liquids last night, let's put it that way. So if my voice sounds a couple octaves lower, I'm recovering. <laughs> but here we are. The dedication is real. <laughs> continue, continue. Uh, yeah, let's move to corner because, Dan, this is an intriguing one. And this is another one that I have said that I do not believe, given the Chargers' current backfield right now, even with the addition of Christian Fulton, that the Chargers could come out of day two and not select a corner. And this, to me, is actually a very intriguing option, especially if the Chargers trade back from five to, let's say, 11. The board completely flips, in my opinion. I know a lot of people have been talking, you know, okay, yeah, then you take your offensive tackle at 11 and a trade back, and then you move from there. To me, I feel different about it. I actually would flip my entire board to start looking at the likes of Terry on Arnold, Quinion Mitchell, possibly at 11. I really believe that for this Chargers team, if that is how it ended up going, that you could see a scenario play like play out like that. And from what we know, especially just after some of the moves that have already been done in free agency, uh, Jim Harbaugh listens to his coaches. And when you look at Jesse Minter running his defense now, Clay Scale running the secondary, you know you need some people out there that can play press man and that can tackle and that are going to fortify that secondary. Because right now, there is a number of different question marks outside of Derwin James. Asante Samuel Jr. is right in the middle, but with Jasir Taylor and Dean Leonard, Christian Fulton, you don't, you'd hope that he could become a reclamation project at this point in time, being 25 years old. Hopefully he can resurrect his career and get over some of the injury hump injuries that he has had over the last couple of years. But you, you need somebody back there in this backfield because you know beyond this year, Asante Samuel Jr., is he worthy of a second contract as it currently stands right now? I would think that that would be up for debate at, at this point in time. And as we have talked about many times on this show, Asante Samuel Jr. was the highest cornerback pick in the draft since Jason Verrett. It has been way too long That's that this insane. franchise has put enough effort into reinforcing the cornerback position. So for me, Dan, yeah, I think that this isn't maybe this you could consider this another sneaky type of position, especially more likely if the Chargers trade down than not. But if they trade down, whether it's at 11 or 23 and you get that extra draft capital, I could totally see corner being a possibility for round one. Yeah, and corner, honestly, is a fascinating position in this draft class and for the Chargers because I, I think, and I challenge, so in the chat, folks who are listening, watching live, in terms of impact positions, what positions do you feel? Let's go top three. Do the Chargers need to bring the most skill into that position in order for the team to succeed in 2023 what three positions need to improve the most this coming season through the draft let us know in the chat corner for me is like clear and above top two like it's not even close it's pro i mean it's one honestly it's one it's it, it absolutely is the most important position considering all of the things that this team has going for it you look at how jesse minter's defense normally runs look at how important physicality and tackling is to that defense and also the lack of any of that on this defensive secondary right now the chargers cornerback room is not good like at all it is not an nfl caliber db room corner specific and they need at least two corners, one of which needs to be a bona fide CB1 that can be a press man corner, can shut down a third to half the field. They don't have that. They can't even sniff that on the roster. They couldn't sniff that last year on the roster, if we be honest. They also got to get that slot guy. They also got to get that versatile chess piece. Both of those positions can be filled at different times. You can go the bona fide CB1 early in round one. I, you could probably say round two. There's a bunch of corners that I love in this draft class. But there's also the, the, the Swiss Army knife type of corners 
you got the Cooper DeGene's, you got the Sandra Still. They can get later on. And there's some other kids, Elijah Jones, Jerrion Jones, both of the Joneses I love. They have to go corner early. At least one of the corners has to be picked in the first two rounds. Unless, and this is the good news for Chargers fans, is they have early round picks every single every single round. Someone can fall. So a round two corner could probably be had early round three. Some corners that I love, Jake, and I haven't really talked, we haven't talked that much about corners. We will soon. Uh, Andrew Phillips, you're starting to see a lot of name. A lot of people talk about him out of Kentucky. I think he's a sleeper. Everyone talks about Max Melton. The guy's a stud. Uh, Elijah Jones, give me some of that. Kamal Hatton out of Tennessee. Love him. Rado Green, I've been super high on him for a long time. And don't sleep on Nehemiah Pritchett. There's some guys here they can get later on. But yes, corner by far and away, the most important position this Chargers team needs to hit on. And it will directly impact. Like if they get, if you look at wide receiver versus corner, and let's say you get a bona fide wide receiver one and you hit a triple, right? It's a great pick the guy produces. Or a bona fide triple hit corner. The corner will make far more of an impact to this team and its success than the wide receiver. They have, they cannot miss on a corner given what this cornerback room is right now. I would agree with that. I was looking at some of the, you know, people's priority list in the chat. Mm. And the one that I saw that came up, one of the, which was one of the first ones, Dan is linebacker. And I actually think this could make the argument that this could be the, sneakiest position that the Chargers actually put a higher value on and what they select in the draft. We've gone through our top 10 linebackers in this draft thus far and specifically tailoring them to the ones that fit the best in what Jesse Minter wants to run in this defense. And when it comes to coverage ability, Jesse Minter values that a ton with what he wants out of his linebackers. And now, you know, Dan Henley, obviously, didn't get enough snaps during his rookie season, so it's still jury's still out on what that's going to look like for him in a full time role. You bring back Denzel Perryman, you still have Nick Neiman on this roster, uh, Die, who is brought in for special teams purposes. Both Perryman and Die brought in on one year deal, so you know you have to invest in the linebacker position at some point. For Dan and I, in no discernible order, the four best linebackers that we believe match what Jesse Minter wants to run in coverage is Edger and Cooper. Peyton Wilson, Cedric Gray, and Junior Colson. Junior Colson, mm. st- strangely enough, Dane Brugler from The Athletic put out a very nice little spotlight video on him and actually asked the question, does Junior Colson make it past the Chargers at 37? <laughs> which everyone, Dan, which honestly, any time you put Michigan player beats Chargers, does it? Do yes, they make exactly. It pass? <laughs> right. Anybody could link any of the 18, you know, draft prospects out of Michigan immediately to the Chargers for good reason. It makes sense. Yep. I still am pounding the over of one and a half that you have two Michigan players that end up on the Chargers roster by the end of day three of the draft. But Dan, in terms of the linebacker position, what do you what do you think on this? Because you and I through all of just like these draft needs in general, I mean, there's plenty still to go through and you can make an argument to say where the ceiling is or where the floor is for each one of these positions, but is linebackers being slept on? Or do you think that this is one that they could push to the back of the board because of higher needs? Hmm. I, I don't think it's being slept on. And I think the reason is because there's just not that many in this draft class. And so like what it's like, once you get past, in my opinion, once you get past Cooper, Colston, or Colston and Wilson, it's like I'm not picking another linebacker until probably round five. <laughs> like, it's just not worth it. So you're probably going to have, like, Peyton Wilson, Edge, and Cooper are probably going to be your one-two. Junior Colston, might, I mean, maybe gets in the one-two. I doubt it. That seems more scheme dependent, in my opinion. And again, looking at linebackers specifically for this Chargers team, it is all about versatility and athleticism. If a linebacker is not versatile or athletic, they're not going to be selected. I promise you. That's how this team rolls because they need versatility to run 
the multiple things that this defense wants to do under midterm. Put that stamp on it. But there's a bunch of guys later on that can fill that position. Like the other linebacker from Michigan is good. I like Michael Barry. And no one's talking about him because he's not one of the top guys. But the way this Chargers team has gone through free agency just feels like they are setting themselves up to go premium positions early. They've gone all non-premium positions in free agency because those are the ones you can get for cheap. They're going to be getting the high ticket ones early because that's what they've set themselves up to do. They're not going to go out and get a running back crazy early after they went and signed a running back in free agency. They're not going to go out and sign a tight end after they just signed 17 tight ends in free agency. They're not going to go get a center in round one after they just signed a center to be the bridge for this team. Like that's, in my opinion, that's bad roster building. They haven't signed a receiver. They haven't signed a corner. That means that has shown any sort of production and um, there's a word I'm looking for. It's just based on it. Uh, I lost it, but consistency. There we go. I'm back. Uh, so take that for what it's worth. I, I think. Pete, I mean, Peyton Wilson. I just. And, and this is a part that's always kind of fun. And I, Jake, you and I and Jace were actually talking offline. Like the hard part, I think, for myself and for Chargers fans is while I could never see myself getting Peyton Wilson early, and while I could never see myself, you know, going certain positions at certain times, like it's not about that. And this team, especially under Jim Harbaugh, zigs where other teams X. And so what do we know? I don't know. Peyton Wilson is definitely the archetype that, like, if they're going to go that direction and they go versatile and athletic, I don't know if you can be more versatile and athletic than Peyton Wilson. The guy's an absolute freak show. Let's flip it back over to the offense, Dan, and you mentioned the position there during your linebacker speech. The running back position, which actually I feel like is probably the best possible thing in terms of value goes for the chargers, because this is a, this to me is a position that you could really put toward the back burner and still get someone who's going to be very productive simply because of the fact that I believe that they are going to do a running back by committee Raven style offense. Now that you brought in Greg Roman and Gus Edwards to this team. So I don't see them targeting a running back in this draft early, Later. not yeah, early. I, I would actually say when you give the other priorities, I actually wouldn't put it before day three personally. So oh. you got two fourth round picks, and that's probably where I would say that given where the roster stands now and the needs you have before, that that's where the conversation could start. So if you're talking about a Ray Davis and Isaiah Davis and uh, Isaac Garendo, any one of those three, I know everybody's got their favorites and there's not really a unanimous RB one for, you know, the consensus out there. I know some people believe Jonathan Brooks is the guy. Others believe Blake Corum is the guy. Others believe Trey Benson's the guy. And I totally get it because it's basically just like, look, pick your flavor of what you want. But this is actually probably one of the best things that could happen to the chargers given where their priority <clears throat> stands with this position, because you're not going to be just having one guy that's going to tote the rock in this offense. I think you're finally going to see what Isaiah Spiller is made up, uh, made of in this offense, but it's going to be a three-headed monster. Do I think running back is going to be addressed? Absolutely. The Chargers will select one in this draft. And I know, Dan, we've heard a bunch of things as far as to say, okay, Blake Corum, people have put out there to say, like, if he's there at 37, do the Chargers actually take it? No, I, I just can't bring myself to believe that. Blake Corum, obviously another one of the favorites in terms of the Michigan players to be drafted love, by the Chargers. Dan Blake is extremely Corum, high for him in terms of overall fits. Dan has Blake Corum as his number one guy that would fit in this offense. But in general, Dan, how do you feel? It's not even close. It's not even close. <laughs> how do you feel like this running back class? I mean, we talked about this running class in depth, but in general, as far as how the draft may play out, you could get a number of different guys that could fill a running back by committee style and be extremely productive. Yeah. I mean, honestly, round four is probably the sweet spot. Whereas where you can probably get, I'd argue maybe round five might be where you get the most value. Round four is probably where you can kind of take your pick of that maybe second shelf of, of running backs, which is fine, especially if you're going running back by committee. And, and 
There's a like there's a couple of players, and we just talked about it. How like any anytime someone's from Michigan, like oh, if they're there, like the Chargers are passing up. There's a couple like specifically with three, I think that the Chargers would be like locked in on. I think Mike Sanders still is like he is a Los he's Angeles Charger. Oh <laughs> like he's God. up there, right? I, I think Roman Wilson is another one that I don't think people are doing enough of. Uh, research on of like holy crap imagine him and the separation we had Trevor Sikama and that dude went like when he was talking about separation scores like holy Roman Wilson yes um and Blake Corum is another one you talk about and you hear so much from the Michigan side of how much Blake Corum meant to that team and to that coaching staff on and off the field and how great he is locker room presence set the standard Blake Corum, like, I think I've tweeted when someone said 37. Like, I think round three, it's going to be very I, – I, I can imagine how tough it would be to see Harbaugh and company not draft him. But let's just – theoretically, if Blake Corum is there with their first pick in round four, I am willing to bet – and they didn't go running back before – I would put a six-pack that Blake Corum is a selection. Like I, I would be so confident in that selection because of all the things I mentioned. Um, but again, round four, like that's the sweet spot for me. There are so many guys that I love. Audric Estime, like he's been my guy from the jump. I know he had the bad time, but like I don't care, man. Like he's that dude. Uh, Marshawn Lloyd, I think yes. he's my favorite of all of them. Just pure skill. I think that fits this team. I think Blake Horn fits better, but Marshawn Lloyd, I think, has just that fun factor, right? Um, but there's a bunch. You can go past that, too. Like, I know you're big on Bucky Irving. I don't think the Chargers go that direction, but, like, they could, I guess. Um, I don't know, man. Like, like I just – there's a bunch of running backs that I think round four is pro- – round four, round five is probably when most teams end up going that direction. Um but that's a position where, kind of what we were talking about before, given the other needs on this team and the other holes, as much as we want to say this team needs a running back, if they went out this year with the current running back roster, like, I've seen worse, honestly. And if that's where they end up having to go, okay. That's why running back has gotten pushed down so low. I just can't. With Gus Edwards there, I just don't see them going early for it. Did I see the director was in here, by the way? He is in here. Oh! He was in here. Yo! The director! And he, made, <laughs> and he, up, made a, he made a nice selection on his running back choice, by the way. Love Braylon Allen, too, man. Like, that'd be... Give, Jordan, give, me, give me him. That'd be fun. When we had Jordan Reed on the show, said the perfect fit for the Chargers in this offense would be Braylon Allen. Dan, let's flip it to the offensive line. And I want to say that because it's in two parts. Because I think that there's, me personally, I think that there's one part of the offensive line that you address before another. And that's the center position. We know we brought in Bradley Bozeman as basically a stopgap center as it, as it stands with his offense. Again, familiarity with Greg Roman, familiarity with the Ravens organization in general. This is a nice year to go out and get a center. Again, I am extremely bullish on this particular class and as many of all of us would love to have jpj and even in a possible trade down scenario if the chargers end up in the teens i just don't see that situation playing out i'm a big big fan of zach frazier i still will stand on it that if he remained healthy this entire season this could be a great battle to see who was going to be the first of those guys to come off the board first as it relates to the center position. You go down a little bit further, Dan. Cedric Van Pran, I just think, is is extremely athletic, gets to the second level very, very well. Um, I think he would be, do very nicely in this uh, in this offense. And then you get to Hunter Norzad, who just fits the profile perfectly for what Greg Roman 
wants to run. And again, if we're talking about running the football with as much as they are talking about doing, he offers versatility, played both tackle positions a couple of years back, uh, kicked inside. He's basically just like the Swiss army knife across the offensive line, but obviously his measurables and where he probably will find a lot more, the best success will be at the center position. So I would love to grab him. Even if the chargers decide to wait a little bit longer, Drake Nugent out of Michigan, again, Michigan connection, but I really like what I saw of Drake Nugent in his um, only year there at Michigan. I thought he's very highly intelligent for the center position, sniffs out a lot of the blitzes and the stunts, able to pass protect really well. Tanner Bordellini, Dan, who arguably could be the most athletic center in this class out of Wisconsin. I really like what I've seen from him as well. So there's a plethora of center guys that you could go after in this draft, but where would you say, because this is kind of in the same breath as the linebackers, as the corners, you know, you have your starter as it stands right now, but you know that you need to invest in this, sure. and especially as it relates to Justin Herbert for the next four or five years and beyond of where that this offensive line is going to be at, at that point in time, where would you say the conversation at least starts for it? I personally believe I wouldn't be shocked. Probably, probably two, probably. I mean, two if Zach three, Frazier is on the three. board at 37, I could see I, a si- situation playing like that. Probably see, only probably only if the Chargers were to trade down and get more draft capital. That changes the math for sure. Yes. And, and and so like and we've talked about that like right now. Folks in the chat, okay. Currently the Chargers have nine selections. I'm gonna put the number, I'm gonna put the line at ten and a half. Ten and a half selections by the time this draft is over. Over or under? <laughs> and I think it's over. Could I'm, you, I, I'm, yeah. I would put I would put my house on it. It's over. very, it's very fun to think of, especially if you just go back and you listen to the first press conference of Joe Hortiz and what he has learned in his 26 years at Baltimore in terms of how to maneuver around the draft board and find value in later rounds and measure who's still on the board at that point in time, I could totally just see him going scorched earth and doing a couple of these big trade downs, whether it's in round one, round two, even beyond that. You know you already have two picks in round four, but yeah, I would say definitely over 10 and a half. I got people in here saying under. I'm like, what? I mean, yeah, I could be wrong, but like, the, I mean, it's not, yeah. it's not out of the question because, hey, if you were able to trade back, acquire more assets, and then there's somebody that you really, really like, do you then use your assets to come back up and select your players? Ooh, here's a question. Raging Bull. By the way, if you have questions or comments, I know, Jake and I, we've been talking a bit, so let's let you guys get a chance. Uh, give us your questions or topics. We'll put them in here. Um, Raging Bull, JPJ or TJ Tampa, who would you rather have at 37? I mean, I, I don't believe that. JPJ falls to yeah. 37. I, that to me would be a shocker. But if for some reason he was there, you could definitely make a compelling argument to say, how fast can you run up the card at that standpoint? Do you, okay, um, but do you, but like, like, I guess maybe the better question to frame this is like, which one of those guys do you think makes the most impact? Oof. <laughs> That's, I mean, right, you would, you would, you would the probably, probably different for short. You would probably term. give the edge to TJ Tampa strictly because he's probably going to see a lot more playing time immediately than what JPJ mm-hmm. would, and that would be the the only one. If you were thinking long term, I would say this is JPJ in a landslide. I would agree. I would agree. Uh, Dan Siegel says they need twelve picks in total to fix the majority of positions on this team. Double dip corner, wide receiver, linebacker, defense tackle. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, remember there are UDFAs, they're still free agency and they have like a ton of money to spend on free agency. So no, they don't need 12 picks. They don't. It'd be nice. Give them on rookie contracts for sure. But they, there's a lot, they set themselves up well, which also, can we give a round of applause? Like I know the Keenan Allen thing was tough. And like, I think as dust has settled, people understood it a bit. Two months ago, this quote unquote cap hell was like all in what he's talking about. And within a couple a matter of weeks, they completely flipped the script. And now, like the roster is in a pretty healthy spot. Once ne- once this coming year ends and the JC Jackson money gets off the books, 
They're probably going to restructure Herbert's at some point, Derwin's at some point. They're probably going to end up extending. I would imagine they're going to set like Rashawn Slater's happening here soon. Josh Palmer, probably too. Um, what they've done is pretty remarkable to where now like they've got a lot of money and we've heard them talk about how like free agency is still not even remotely close to being done. Like, there's a lot of signings to be had. It, it's so, not just, even I, I think, I think, they'll be, I, I think they'll be pretty aggressive in free agency once the draft ends. Yeah, and it's not just what you've set up for yourself, you know, at, as you said, after the draft, Dan. But, I mean, now look at, the, look at the flexibility you've given yourself for next year when that salary cap is expected to go up even higher. So think about how much of a better position the Chargers are going to be in financially to, your point, the Rashawn Slater signing and any of the other ones. <laughs> the director says, <laughs> if we get 12 picks, I'm flooding the internet with Jeff Ortiz dressed as a Monopoly guy. Hey, I, I'll, I'll wear the monocle. Absolutely. Like Joe Hortiz yes. would have passed go in that situation big time. Yes. Frodo Swaggins. I agree with him wholeheartedly. Please give us a like, subscribe. I, mean, I think those likes don't show up in real time, so not a big deal. But if you have not already done so, please do us a favor. Hit that like and subscribe. Uh, it does help us out a ton. Dan Siegel. You're right. Actually, with Harbaugh knowing a ton of the UDFA guys, I think we could find some gems there, too. Also true. Uh, Forgotten Lowcap says, imagine how much hinges on Palmer and Quinton having to play at a higher level. I think that's this is the, the part thing. that is scary. I think it's the other thing that gets forgotten in this whole discussion about when the Chargers should, you know, select a wide receiver. And for those that don't believe that they're going to do it at five or whatever it is. Remember, Joshua Palmer's <laughs> contract is up after this season. What do you do? Where do you go? And yes, yeah, so you're expecting a, a, there's a lot of pressure right now for Quentin Johnston to see a big jump in his play in year two. You would believe that Joshua Palmer is immediately going to slot into the Keenan Allen role as it certainly stands right now. Obviously that could change in 10 days, given who the Chargers could ultimately end up drafting. But this is the other thing that you have to take into account, Dan. It's not just supplanting Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. It's supplanting what you're not going to have a year from now. So you have to and, start playing the long game. And it's funny because I'm, I'm catching myself already. Previous regime, I would almost guarantee that they re-sign Josh Palmer. But then you fast forward and like the chess, not checkers approach that Joe Hortiz plays, like with comp picks and stuff. Sure, they can re-sign Josh Palmer. But like, let's just say, let's just say for that, like for example, let's say that this year Josh Palmer balls out, right? Gets um, balls out. Let's say eight hundred yards, five touchdowns, right? That comp pick is going to be nice if they don't. They let him walk. Ortiz probably gets a third. Maybe four. I think that's rich to think about that right now, but I would say no. But like, but that's. I mean, so yes. Would, would hypothetically, you do? if he does, what would you rather have? Hypothetically, let's, let's say he, he performs. That, sure. Let's say he turns out to be wide receiver too, which that's not unlikely. Let's say they draft a high level receiver. They pick one of the big three. They go Josh Palmer. Josh Palmer is wide receiver two. Wide receiver one gets a thousand. He gets eight hundred. Whatever. Let him walk. Would you rather let him walk and get your third, fourth round comp pick back, or resign him for? 12 million, 10 million a year. That's what makes it sweat. Like, Joe Ortiz changed the math there a bit. So, um, where are you at? I wanted to ask you. Um, early on in this process, it was like Bowers at five, right? And it feels like almost unanimously, Bowers has been essentially forgotten. And some of that might be because of what happened during free agency, bringing Will Disley and Hayden Hurst and all that. But let's just say, whatever they end up selecting, it's not fine. They trade down to wherever. And those big three aren't there. Where does Bowers then stack with CB1, probably Edge1, tackle? 
three or four, wide receiver four or five. It's really tough. <laughs> it's really tough because, again, you could maneuver this a lot of different ways. And much like some people would say in the same argument of either offensive tackle or running back or take your pick as far as a position on this Chargers depth chart that actually, you know, has a good amount of bodies. I've had my own battles with Dan months ago on this very topic when we would talk about who are you taking, Malik Neighbors or are you taking Brock Bowers? And we had our own wars. And this is the beauty about free. How agency. stupid do you feel? I'm kidding. I, I, I don't because <laughs> free agency changes everything. Brock Bowers is still going to be a absolute Dude, animal he's for whatever so team good. drafts him. He is him. going to be so good in the NFL, man. Like, oh, gosh. I mean, you know, now the, now the draft talk conversation around Bowers is like everything is starting about 10 as yep, far as yes. how everything has shifted. Because, yes, he's, like you mentioned, you have Will, today, right? Yes, you have, or no, I, I believe he already visited him. I could be wrong. But you have Will Disley. You have Hayden Hurst, only on a one-year deal. You know you're not going to have Donald Parham or Stone Smart in this locker room, potentially, at the after the end of this season. So you, once again, need to revamp it. Now, when you weigh this between what Brock Bowers is, Again, you look at the drop-off between that and the next player, which is Jatavion Sanders, which I really like Jatavion Sanders. Mm -hmm. Really like his play. And I think he'd actually be a nice fit with this team if there was a universe in which the Chargers would end up selecting him at some point. I think this is honestly a scenario where you could probably see the Chargers waiting a little bit. Obviously, there's... Uh, the Theo Johnson's Eric all is a very intriguing tight end prospect, you know, outside of the injuries, he is an extremely athletic tight end that I think fits the mold of where that tight end position is going to just be an athletic mover. Um, ben Sinat out of K uh, Kansas state is another one that they could potentially look at. But the more and more I think about this, Dan, again, we're talking about all of these priorities as it currently stands mm -hmm. right now. And again, I'm not trying to knock, Brock Bowers, I would still love to be in a universe where somehow <laughs> he's right donning. Wow. Yeah, where some somehow he is donning the powder blues. I would love to see it. But after everything has transpired in free agency, and after we're now 10 days out from the draft and talking about the priorities as far as what the Chargers have, I don't see how you could side or how you could select Bowers and make an argument to sidestep another possible position of where the Chargers are going to be. And whether that's at five or whether that's at 11. And I do not cool down on the value of Brock Bowers because I still think he, he should be selected Probably. as highly as possible. But in terms of what the Chargers have currently as it stands right now, I think you go a different direction and look towards another position at that point. Yeah, uh, this is probably unhealthy to think this way, but we'll put it here so folks can all be unhealthy together. I wish Harbaugh was here a year earlier because the last year's depth of tight ends in this draft we would have gotten a top 10 in last year, and we'd have even more flexibility to think. Yeah. Behind the scenes, ah. <laughs> this is probably something that is going to stick in Dan and I's side about the, regarding the 2023 draft more than anything. Mm -hmm. More than anything. Mm -hmm. Given how many tight ends were available in that draft last year that could ultimately end up making a nice impact for this team, that was a big surprise when they didn't select one at all. <laughs> and then the reason that he did it was also, I'm not going to get into that. Why don't the person's point? Uh, fitness. This is a question. So Marcus Brady at the podium last week, he talked about like building a basketball team, which talking to, honestly here, heard that term with the previous regime too, about building a basketball team for your receivers. And I understand the analogy. So let's run with it for a sec. Fitness says QJ wide receiver one, Hayden Hurst wide receiver two, and Palmer wide receiver three. Historically, tight ends to get a ton of production in Harbaugh's offense is probably where he's going with Hayden Hurst wide receiver two. I can see it, I guess, if he ends up being that guy. But if we're building a basketball team with your receivers, what positions don't they have? On the hardwood. Repeat the question again. 
Say that again. If the Chargers staff is wanting to build a basketball team. Right. And I'll ask this in the chat too, folks comment. What position of the five or positions of the five do they not have on the roster right now? Because you heard Marcus Brady and you heard them talk about like some of the traits that they look for. They want guys who can separate and who can be playmakers. And, you know, you obviously want one that's dependable and can separate and speed, like all of that. Like, we, But what don't they have right now? Like, I guess it will go one by one. What is Quinton? What position does he play right now? I mean, he's essentially going to be your... I guess you would call it the first and second year of Mike Williams as a replacement in terms of what he does. Obviously, Mike Williams evolved his game as time went on, but essentially that's where you'd slot him. Joshua Palmer but he should, would be. But he shouldn't be. He should not be that. I hope the team does not make him that. I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm saying if you were to ask me right now, what is he? That's probably where your mind would tell you that that's where you line him up. Joshua Palmer. Like it's like a power, so like power forward center-ish. Okay. How, yeah, however you want to put it. Joshua Palmer is... is slotted right now to take over the Keenan Allen role. Now, obviously everything is that we're talking about is going to change. You're asking me, what are they, are they lacking in that department in terms of building a basketball team? Well, let's see. How about explosion? They've essentially been missing that for the last five years as it relates to wide receiver speed and explosion, which immediately starts making you think of is Malik neighbors, the target in that department. In terms of Marvin Harrison Jr. and Roma Dunze, how they fit the mold, obviously bigger bodied wide receivers can block their tails off the way that they play physical. Uh, definitely fits that mold of something that the Chargers wide receiver group as of right now does not have. But this is what makes it intriguing as it relates to that group. And but this, finishing but, but this is but this is the part, and again, like I'm, I'm going with the, the basketball analogy. I know this is a football podcast, so this might be lost on a lot of people, but I also am a basketball fan. This Chargers team, like you look at, of course, it's a basketball analogy, right? You got your center, you got your point guard, small forward, shooting guard, power forward. Like you got the five positions, right? Maybe you want to go six man, if you will. Like who the fork is a shooting guard on this team right now? I, I legit, they don't have one. Like, one that they terrifies have, defenses, it's not on this they, roster right They now. do not have one. They don't got the guy that can go score 35 a game. Period. They don't, they might have somebody who can score 19 a game in basketball terms. Like, maybe. So, shooting guard. Like, in my opinion, that's someone like a Malik Neighbors. Any one of the big three, honestly. Although I probably know I'd probably say Malik Neighbors would be the shooting guard. If you want to go ultra explosiveness, that's shooting guard, right? That's your Kobe. But let's say you want to go like a uh, a LeBron James type, right? That's probably more of a Marvin Harrison archetype. That's probably more of like a power forward, small forward, maybe. Again, pick your poison as far as. Which, run, which wide receiver is going to fit this offense the best. In my opinion, you could find a fit for all three of them. I personally just think that you gear more towards, if everything that we have heard from Jim Harbaugh and Greg Roman as far as what they want to install in this defense, to me that gives the edge in terms for to make the argument for a Marvin Harrison or a Roma Dunze. Not necessarily saying that I am ranking a Dunze ahead of Neighbors because Neighbors' skill set is just a different animal in itself. He's just a very different wide receiver. He's, the Steph, he's like a Steph two. Curry type, right? right. If you're going so, basketball terms, he's your Steph Curry. John if, 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 you were to, if you were to tell me, Dan, if this was the old regime and it came down to Harrison Jr. and Neighbors, I might actually give the edge to Neighbors based off of how they thought. Really? Based off of how they thought. Really, I would. Mm -hmm. I would have gotten Roma Dunze in a heartbeat. <laughs> you probably, you, pro you probably would have been right. Maybe just in terms of what they needed, and maybe, I, maybe now that I'm saying that, I'm wrong because they passed on Zay Flowers last year. So maybe I just killed my own <laughs> argument. It's like, oh no, <laughs> which is never going to be something that I will get over from the standpoint that that Zay Flowers was there as much as I was pounding the table for him. <laughs> so, but mm -hmm. who knows? This 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 entire regime in terms of how it looks, it, you know, we're never going to know what really is going to happen until it happens, but we'll have a damn sure good idea of what this team is going to look like and what it wants to do by the end of day three. Dan, I want to get in one more position here uh, before we get out. 
one of the other sneaky positions that we just really have not talked about because it's not high on the priority list in the observation of what people perceive tackle is, what people perceive wide receiver or corner, much and that's making the argument here. And we've talked about how Jim Harbaugh loves to prioritize the trenches. And people might automatically start thinking that means, okay, that that's going to be the offensive line. The Chargers need some people in the middle on the defensive side of the ball. On the Graham Barton line. is like, he is like the one that I'm circling of who I'd want. Oh, you're, like you're, a, talking, you're talking in the, in the offensive trenches. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you saying defense? I'm sorry. De- defense yes, trenches. defense. Oh, sorry. Yeah. In the, on the defensive side of the ball, you know, you lost Sebastian Joseph Day. You lost Austin Johnson. Scott Matlock, you're hoping, takes another leap forward. Same with Tito. But you need some other guys in the middle of that defense that's going to be able to help out your edge rush in Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack, and Thule. And if we're looking at that position, Dan, I'm a huge fan of Braden Fisk. And do I see a possibility where he is there at 37? Yes. Do I believe that that's a route that the Chargers go with the 37th overall pick? Probably not, Uh, (laughs) unfortunately. But we've seen mocks that have Ruka Roro shooting up draft boards right now. Some people have put him in the slot at 37. We already know that you have your your Johnny Newtons, uh, your – your Byron Murphy's of this draft and what that's going to look like. Is Trevante Sweat is is Sweat now off your board? Given what took Absolutely place, with him? not. I'm, okay, I'm good. 100%. I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to make sure. I just heartbeat. wanted to make sure because immediately, as soon as I heard that news, I thought to myself, the Chiefs are going to find a way to snag this guy, <laughs> and he's going to be and just end up being a monster. Yeah, but, the Chiefs, the Ravens, the Cowboys. One of these, they're going to yeah. Yes. So I think that his draft stock definitely will take a little bit of a hit. Sure. But yep. you talk about Sweet. a monster that you could put in the middle of this defensive line. So where does the conversation, I guess, even start for defensive line for you, Dan? Um, that's a good question. Uh, this when I, when I, and I think when I think of defense, like up and down every position, I keep thinking like it, they need to be versatile. And one thing that has kind of plagued this Chargers team, I'm going to make a short answer long for a sec. Like the, the Chargers defensive line, interior wise, like it has been so long since it has been an impact on football games. And, and we, and Chargers fans are no stranger to seeing opposing defensive lines wreck havoc and directly impact the Chargers ability to do anything. Like how many times have we seen Chargers balls batted down because of how many times Justin Herbert is forced to pass? How many times have we seen the Chargers inability to run? Part of that is because the offensive line and blocking is terrible, but also because the opposing defensive line is great or give up crazy amount of pressures. The Chargers' interior defense line has not been good in a minute. And so while I would like, like, on one side of me, I'm thinking, yeah, but is it as important as, you know, corner, receiver, or linebacker, or, you know, in t- tackle? So- mm-hmm. But, like, I've been without it for so long, I don't know what I don't know. Like, I don't know what I'm missing. I haven't seen it in so long. But it is such a cheat code to have a defensive front. Like, go look at what San Francisco does and what Philly does and what Dallas does. Like, having a front that can stop anyone is a cheat code. The Chargers just haven't had. So, where would I do it? I mean, that's pro- in my opinion, that's probably if you can go, <laughs> like, if you can go Jenkins, round f- f- yeah, yeah. three or four. Round, like three or four is probably where I would do it. You think Jenkins but last? Till no, I don't. Like that's what okay. I'm saying. Like, I don't like. I I just other positions are more important, but you can still get an impactful defensive line. Like defense. Like this is kind of like the premise of this conversation is like, generally speaking, certain positions you got to pick at a certain spot if you really want to increase your chances of them being an impactful player. Like if you're looking for a bona fide superstar. Why or a corner or tackle, like 
it is very hard to find one of those that hit later. Yeah, you can find success stories, sure, but the vast majority of them are first and second round picks. Linebacker, interior defensive line, running backs, like a lot of those positions, you can find success later on. Interior offensive line, same thing. So probably, probably fourth would be the earliest that I would do it. Unless, again, this is where the math changes. If they can get free draft picks by trading down. That's the kicker. It affords you to go after certain positions that maybe you couldn't do otherwise. Yeah, trade value aside, I could see an argument to be made, depending on how the board falls to you, where you could start this conversation in round three. I could. I could see that as a possibility. Most likely, probably not. But like you said, this all depends on trade value and acquiring additional capital, which gives you more flexibility to move around the board and prioritize other positions higher. But if it was me, I would probably say that the ceiling conversation could start at that round three position or uh, round three uh, spot for the Chargers. Uh, Now, depending on who's going to be on the board, no idea. But I would say that if the Chargers are on the clock in that particular round, I wouldn't put it past them to look at the trenches on that side of the ball, because as Dan said, they are in desperate need of help. <laughs> Sweet jumps. We're rounded out here. Uh, last chance. We'll probably have maybe five more minutes. Then we'll, we'll close this thing out. Uh, Sweet jumps says we're getting a new defense and we're running. <laughs> we're going streaking, Jake. We're going streaking. When have we had a defense and run the ball? Like it's been so long. It was 84 years. Like Rose, the Titanic was on the door. The last time the Chargers had a run game. It was brutal. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. That's far too long. Uh, Dan Siegel says trading down second and third are going to be vital. Man, if it was me, I'm trading down in the second round. Or if I'm trading down in the first, I'm also trading down one of those selections. If they do the 11 and 23 thing, trade 23. Like, if you can get – if you could add a couple top 100 picks to their existing – Selection numbers, like, dude, that's just a cheat code. With this staff, yeah. Like, I'm doing that. Billy Marks says, I think the Chargers should trade out the Vikings, grab a receiver and an offensive lineman. A lot of times, you see people say it's like an either or, right? The Chargers, if the Chargers believe that they need to improve their tackle position. That doesn't mean that they don't think they have to improve the wide receiver position. Like it's a two lane thing. They got to do both. Right. Like we all know, everyone knows the Chargers have to improve the wide receiver room. If they believe the the tackle room needs to get improved now, that will not mean they're not going receiver. Like I can promise you that. So how do you do both lanes? That's where you trade back. Jake, anything else? We went through a bunch here. Um, and a lot of this, I think, is more so just trying to get in the minds, in the mindset of this Chargers staff, right? Because it's different. And they prioritize things differently than A, previous regimes, and B, current existing NFL teams. Like, they go through things differently. And they're bringing a brand of football that's been a bit. Yes. Let's touch on a fun one, Dan, to close us out here today. Jake, what will your drink of choice be on draft night? Do you have anything special to say for that night? So That depends. Dan, Dan almost <laughs> kind of spilled the beans just a little bit. So it's, I'll, I'll try to make a you know quick story here. So for the last 15 years, uh, I have thrown a draft party where I have people that come out of town to come to this. Obviously, Dan has been a part of this since we've been doing this show. And it is bonkers because we literally get contingents of fans from different teams and we have seen people flip out at certain picks and it is just glorious to watch while alcohol is being consumed and it makes it for just an overall fun experience. I will say this, the Dalmore 12, Dan, which was the same bottle that I popped open to pour one out for Keenan Allen when he was ultimately traded to the Chicago Bears, Mm -hmm. that still has plenty left in the bottle and that a little bit of that can go a long way. So be prepared for that, for sure. There was a question here, and I can't find it. Uh, somebody asked the question, like, who are some of the prospects that you do not want to see the – I hear it is. Gabriel asks, Gabriel, player prospects you don't want to see drafted to our division rivals? All of them. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> like, that's the problem is – 
the Chargers are only going to get a you know a finite number of prospects. But like the chances are, your opposing division rivals are going to get a couple of them. Like, and this is what makes division rivalry so fun: is you give me any pick, I could be like, oh, of course, the forking Chiefs got yes. blank. Much in because the same you know breath, what, because of... you know what the staff's going to do with them. Like that's because you trust yes. them, right? right. Much the in Raiders, the same breath as story, I won't. But... Yeah, much in the same breath as I won't forgive the Chargers for passing on Zay Flowers when Trent McDuffie went to the ah. Chiefs. Yeah. Yep. That's a scar that probably will not go away. So if if you were talking about, and now we know that the Chiefs need another cornerback because they let go of Legarius Need. So. Good Lord. <laughs> what what do they do? The hell, they could even possibly trade out of the first round, accumulate more draft picks and do that. But damn, if you were to tell me one of the big time corners that we have talked about ends up on that team, it's probably going to be that feeling all over again. Yeah, probably. Probably. Nick says, guys, Chargers still have $30 million to spend on free agents, give or take, depending on the money for the draft class and all that. Yeah, I said it before. I think the Chargers are going to be big in free agency after the draft. Um, and they could do it. They have a lot of positions. Don't count out the UDFAs. Jake, anything else? We went through a bunch. For folks in the chat, seriously, thank you guys. You guys gals. have been awesome. Yeah, what did we miss, Jake, before we get out of here? Uh, I think the only ones that we didn't cover were edge and offensive line, which, again, we've got rankings to do that we will still make sure that we will close out before the NFL draft takes place on April 25th. Uh, definitely expect the cornerback and wide receiver rankings to be a very very fun show and those will come separately and they will be there'll be a lot to obviously talk about on those shows but this was a good exercise in general of just kind of what to be prepared for for the nfl draft and just to give kind of a broad idea now again dan and i have no idea of what ultimately will end up taking place but if there are curveballs thrown by joe hortiz and jim harbaugh on draft night gives you a good idea of who they could target in certain rounds Amen. I'm so freaking excited for this draft because, like, this is like a movie that I don't know the plot, but I know it's going to be a great movie. It's like if someone told me, you know, you know, Christopher Nolan's going to make a movie, I'm buying tickets. I don't care what the movie is. I'm buying the tickets. So I know it's going to be great. Like, that's like what if he Marvel just told you, brought. if he just told you, Christopher Nolan's going to make a movie about a nuclear bomb. Done. <laughs> okay. Let's, it can let's, be let's Christopher Nolan makes a movie about chess. I'm like, sick, dude. That let's go. Let's go see what happens. Awesome. That's what Jim Harbaugh and Joe Hortiz and the staff are bringing to this charge team and the fan base. So much excitement. Jim Beard, $10 donation. Shout out to you, man. Uh, Jake, we're getting a lot of love here. It's making me blush. So if I get red, that's why. Uh, Raging Bull. You've been no, red since you started the show. <laughs> yeah. Because the night before, we're not getting into that. Uh, thank you guys for this awesome stream. A couple of questions came in about us doing a stream for draft night. Uh, We're going to try to do something. We're going to try to do something. So what we've done the past, what has it been, Dan? Two years that we've done it? We try to do it building up to the actual draft start. Um, And again, I say that just because of people that we're going to be having at my place uh, during that point in time. Uh, Still have to obviously socialize with with them when they come over but the backyard is going to be open much as it was last year we had the entire lafb family uh come over last year and we were i think it was within an hour of the draft that we were talking about what we felt that the charters were going to do and what could possibly happen so it was a good little last minute intriguing conversation hoping to do the same again this year so keep an eye out for that yeah we got some fun ideas that were still kind of flushed out but might have some things jake fitness asked what's the worst nightmare movie can i put in my vote for 2020 three Los Angeles Chargers. <laughs> oh, that, oh, that's the title of the movie. That's, that's the movie. Yeah. That was the movie. Got it. I was thinking if he was talking about nightmare on Elm street, this is obvious. It's Freddy's dead. The final nightmare. That is the worst nightmare movie. Oof. Okay. <laughs> oh man. All right. For Jake Hefner, this has been fun for myself. Uh, thank you for everybody that has kind of come in here. These are always a blast. Uh, Love you guys. Great show. Lots of excitement for the future, says James Wagner. You're the best, James. Uh, in short, Chargers fans have so much to be excited for. We have a lot of things in store. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, if you have not already done so, please do us a favor. Hit that like to subscribe. It takes three seconds to go ahead and do. 
Um, until then, we'll talk to you next time on the next Chargers Unleashed.